I'm a collegeist and, and I do ecological landscape design. And what I'm not is, a, is, is an accountant. And my, my wife is, and she would think that it was quite ironic that, that I have this, this topic that, that we, we, were, we, we came up with. I mean, very, if it's apropos. So, um, so we came up, hey, Heidi and I were talking about this. We, have a, we, have a, we came up with a question. How to properly budget for adaptive management of urban prairie projects. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it, uh, a, 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 def, a definition of adaptive management, one that I've got to follow. And then we'll go through these slides real quick, and then, um, and then we'll go back to the question. So adaptive management promotes flexible decision making that can be adjusted in the face of uncertainties as outcomes from management actions and other events become better understood. So in a nutshell, you're, you're, you're adapting your management um, as, as things change. Um, or your, your maintenance. So uh, we're looking at, at uh, this is, this is a, a very small private project, um, and, uh, but I, do, I don't do very many private projects. I do more um, public, but, but we thought that because of, because of the group that, that this would be a, a good shift from, from all the other projects. So let's just look at this real quick and, and we'll see how, um, Adaptive management or, or budgeting was not uh, adaptive management budgeting was not considered very well in this project, and so we had to, we had we've had to back up and, and look at it in a, in a, in a, and managing it a different way. So go ahead and we'll flip through them. So this is just kind of go ahead, go ahead. And we're just preparing the site and selling the site, and uh, so right here is where we were pretty much done with the site, and and we were. We were, that was our job, we, were, we, we finished the site, we were supposed to have a maintenance com company come back, come in and take care of it, so go forward. Um, so right here is where I started to I, get concerned because the next, the next picture, the next one, so right here is where things started, the, the client started really enjoying what she was seeing. <laughs> go ahead, and, and this is where I kind of freaked out because this is where I realized <laughs> that what, what was happening was not what I wanted to see, but she was very excited about it. But what's happening here is that the watering, uh, the watering was, was, was adjusted after we left the site so that one species really exploded, this Tictoria, this Coreopsis. Oh, and you jump forward, but, so this is what happens when you don't budget. For something like the water going haywire and exploding one species is that, your, own, your, your client is out there weeding, weeding her yard. <laughs> um, and so what happened was, was we, we did not budget for uh, the, the, the over-irrigation and this explosion of this plant, which it, it requires uh, pulling. It, it, it's, it's really weedy, it's very kind of almost woody when it gets that thick. So go forward. And um, so this is just kind of the, the ongoing struggle that we had after it, and we'll just roll through them. And and then and so that's that's the that's the that's the uh, that's the slideshow. So um, I guess back to properly uh, how to properly budget for adaptive management of urban prairie projects. And that's the question that I have for you guys: um, is uh, as how 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 do we do that? You know, I mean, when I started doing this, well, I say five years ago when I started working with. Um, Projects that that uh, uh, the theme was that low maintenance and low cost were connected to native uh, projects, native plant projects. And um, now that is absolutely not the case. And if anyone argues that, <laughs> then then whoever's dealing with on the maintenance end of that, or, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. They're going to be stuck with the with the uh, the repercussions. And so. Um, I guess that's the that's the question. I, I don't know how much time I have left to talk, but that's three more minutes. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can just ch kind of jump forward and and um, and uh, uh, look look at it, uh, how how to how to how to adapt uh, how to budget for adaptive management. I'd really like to turn it over to the group. So did y'all have any maintenance on the project once you left it? We did not. It was, they had a maintenance. We, we had a, a maintenance company, and we trained the maintenance company, but we did not train them to, um, uh, we, I should say, we, we trained them for the, what we expected, what we, have, we expected it to unfold, right? For, so for a percentage of, of weeding, 
mowing um, or shredding and, and, uh, and uh, like weed eating and cropping. But we did not we did not expect like uh, um, we did not train them to to deal with just a, a, an explosion like that, right? So we we found that on projects too, and we, we had one project that we had native areas in a commercial project in the. Well, two different, a couple different projects, and we we put maintenance into the contract with the installer to come in and because remo removal of the base is the biggest thing. Yeah. yeah. And um, and then we found they didn't want to mow; they wanted to weed because they really didn't want to mow it. And we're like, you can mow it, but, but it was that was a hard concept to get over. But we found you know that the deep root sedge, the you know, and, and that was a problem on one project that you know we had some this guy who installed it for two years to the maintenance. And after that, it was taken over by somebody who wasn't right. as good, and they didn't know what to pull and what not. Right. That's right. a real issue. We found maintenance, and we have another project that just and it's actually stripped. They made the barriers ripped down. They they got tallow, they got willow, they got, and right. they didn't. They just weren't doing their job, and nobody made them. Right. So we found that maintenance is a really big issue. It is, and, and, and not only that, but but and that's the thing is that how do you how do you get a, a, a adaptive management or adaptive maintenance? You know how how do you look at a site and say well. Um, we didn't. We expected something. Uh, we expected like uh, a basic grass to, to deal with basic grass. We didn't expect to deal with natives that that were going to cause it, or they had to be removed completely. And so, um, yeah. So that's where you have to bu budgeting for adaptive adapting your maintenance and, and management. And that's where uh, that's kind of the the the, uh, the question is, is how do we do that? And and you know, a lot of times you lose it. You lose the project. They'll just Another quick question uh, in terms of the maintenance management thing. Uh, who is in control of the irrigation? The irrigation company. <laughs> Which yeah. is different than? Which was different than us. Uh, and we, we had programmed the irrigation originally, but uh, you know, no one can, and that's another thing is when you have so many different companies, but no one can actually tell me how or tell us how uh, the irrigation got changed. Um, but it did. Uh, because, but yeah, you, you, you kind of you, we were targeting the irrigation for a, a certain result. And when I when we came back, and that was another thing, we didn't budget for coming back and looking at this project. Um, and so when I did actually end up coming back and seeing that, then I thought, well, how, these guys don't even know what what to do. So um, we, we had the we had the owner go out there, and we were explaining to her that. That you know, this is going to be a massive, intensive removal of this of this plant, and um, and she was like, "Well, I'll get there. I'll get out there and do it myself." And 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 that's what happens when you don't budget for it because the, the maintenance companies were were planning on just weed eating around and doing a little bit of cleanup around the native grasses that were supposed to be coming up, but the native grasses got a bit suppressed because of all of these these uh, coreopsis that came up. Um, yeah, so. So again, there. That's the, that's the the question is how do you budget? How do how do you budget for that? And it's, it's 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 a challenge. Did you pulling it, not mowing it? Well, we did. We did. So we did actually did, did end up pulling about ninety percent of that. Yeah, but that was us coming back in and doing it for them. So it seems to me from both of you that what now there are a few landscape somebody or some entities to form a maintenance company that will maintain the native for natural landscapes. I'm working with two right now. Yeah. There, there's, there's a couple of good ones in town that know how to do this. The problem is they're cheaper than Joe Mower. And, and so what is cheaper? They're cheaper. They're, 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 they, they'll come in, they've been the job, and they'll say, oh, I can maintain this, and then they don't. Uh, you know, they, they, they say they're going to do it. Right. Known, and then by the time you, you know, you realize where they are, they, they've got, you know, lots of invasives and they've not, not maintained. Because it seems to, like it, there needs, you know, like, uh, to, there needs to be a training of what to remove and what not to remove and how to maintain that tool, which I, is different from regular. Let me just say one thing. I think one of the key things is that on my end, that I'm where we messed up on this project was not including our. Follow up of the management of the, of the management component of the monitoring component of it, um, and that would have that would have uh, that would have caught it before it getting out of control. Yes. Uh, I was just going to say that exactly is that I think it ties into the larger communication and education that essentially these are human dependent systems that you're producing, yes. and um, and it's a paradigm shift that it's not a instantaneous landscape that's going to need more inputs over time. But you're putting in a lot of effort in the beginning, and then you know you need to come back and do that monitoring and make sure that's something you're not getting out of control. Right. And 
do every cycle, sorry, but to get the wisdom that you need to do monitoring right. is that's even more of a larger sell. But I think if you just say, I can't, this will not be a successful project without right. that oversight, which will be of less input than over irrigating. Right, and, and, and that, and the and the money to, to be flexible with their with maintenance, targeting the maintenance. Yeah. Yes. What would have happened if we just cut back on the watering, and let those? Um, it would have been it would have been a, a manageable where they could have gone in and they could have cleaned it out a little bit. That we were expecting because we had seeded this with so many local different uh, grasses, we were expecting a a, a much stronger. Um, uh, diversity of grasses, uh, uh, density and diversity of grasses. And uh, we didn't get that, we think that we didn't get that because of the dominance of this Coryopsis. Um, it covered and it was so thick, uh, and, and, the, and the moisture, we're not quite sure why on the grass, but um, we, we, we were expecting them to do a little bit of, of cleanup of the forbs and let the, let the grasses come in, but what ended up happening is, and by pulling out this Coryopsis, how, how it ended up happening, they just served, the, a lot of the stool got disturbed, um, these things are really woody uh, and and, um, and and just and thick, and so this, the soil getting getting disturbed, the grass is not coming in as it, as we expected them to. Um, but we are expecting the grass to come in a lot fuller and a lot. Um, yeah, that's right. You're done. Sorry. <laughs> no. Uh, well, no, that was the picture that. I'm not quite sure. That was probably um, before Coryopsis or after. That's after. That's after. Yeah. Yeah. I think that this was taken. Um, I mean, how many months ago? Oh, it was. It was at least eight months ago. Um, I'm not quite sure when. <laughs> So that's okay, so sorry, Scott's supposed to stop talking. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have a question, kind of for you, maybe, as part of this discussion. You know, we've talked about getting the grasses established. Is the answer to this maybe doing, rather than trying to do everything at once, to go in year one and get, get grasses established, and then come in year two and see the forbs into that? Would that be. Um, we're trying to do this too quick. So for you guys that, that didn't hear it back there, she's asking, and this is a great group, uh, question, is the idea maybe better to establish the grasses year one and then add things, add the forbs later on? Once, once yes. you've taken ground, I have mixed emotions about that. I, I tend to feel like if you want something in the mix, it's got to be in there at least a little bit. And it's much easier to get it in there at the beginning than it is midstream. We've done both. Um, so what I would say, what we tend to do is we tend to put down about 70% grass to 30% forbs. Um, I'm not saying that's a perfect system or it works, but it's real grass heavy, just like what you were trying to do there. And, um, and it, it tends to help take ground quickly, but I've seen, you know, it's just highly variable. So I don't know what people are trying out there or want to comment on establishing grasses first and then forbs or mixing the two or yeah and, and the question i would have about that approach is how much are you doing with seed and how much with plug with the product well it depends so the projects we do on the katie prairie we're mostly using seed because it's just so extensive we're doing anywhere between like 12 and 200 acres at a time so um we use mostly seed we use plugs, what we do is we grow out species that we can't get commercially, that we can hand collect. So we're using it to bump up diversity after the fact, and we're also using it as a public engagement tool. So, and we also get people with land self to grow plants at home, green turn nursery, we grow them up for the great grow up. So we, we tend to, um, you know, one of the, the bottlenecks has always been, and we're still working on this, is getting some, some more pioneer grass species that would help set the stage for that restoration. I know that we have been sending Native American seed and NRCS some species. Uh, I think I think uh, one of the grasses that will help with this kind of thing is the purple, purple love grass, which Native American seed is now growing because we had volunteers go out and collect the seed. We need a few pioneer species to really kind of help make our restorations more foolproof. Uh, I would say in our yard, I took out a side yard stuff and put in 
biggest in my plan was, you know, this mealy will support this gara, so it will hold it up, and this will hold up the rattlesnake master. Well, my gara is eight feet tall, and my mealy is. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what I was getting at in terms of it depends. If we're doing a pocket prairie project, it depends on how big it is. So if it's a small project, you can almost, you can go to flow, you can buy the plants, you can plug them in, it can look fabulous. Uh, but if it's a larger project like MD Anderson, that's mostly through seed with limited flows. I agree with the grass, a lot of the grass establishments, but the thing is, I think for a public relations, you need yeah. some yeah. amount of yeah. wildflowers so people can look at them. Right. Focus their eyes on the flowers while your right. grass is developing. Especially, and I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that. We always put, so Lupinus texensis, the, the blue bonnet they grow on the side of the roads, is not technically native to Harris County. I always put it in for two reasons. One, it's a cultural bridge. People think it's illegal to mow that area down. <laughs> no, seriously. You always have to, I always tell people, and we've got a lot of people talking about education over here, which is great. You always have to layer in at least three layers of defense for that prairie project. One is a mowed edge to make it look intentional. One is cultural connection, so blue bonnets, monarchs, that kind of thing. Um, and the third is Texan identity. So if you get all those oh, all those three, nobody wants to be the monster that mows down the blue bonnet Texas pride <laughs> prairie, right? Okay, so you've got to build in those layers. And we also know the blue bonnets are gonna go away. They're, they're, they're disturbing species, so once your prairie matures, you don't have to worry about them not really being from the area. Right, right. that's great. Yeah, by the way, very quickly, uh, we actually at uh, Flood Control used that thing to our advantage, because what we're doing with our wildflowers is not to do wildflowers per se, it gives us an excuse to miss the first yeah. spring mowing. It right. saves the taxpayers money. <laughs> and, um, and we say, oh, okay, mow it, there's blue bonnet saying, You know, in the meantime, everything else is up to chest high. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah.